Hello, everybody, to this week's uh, live webinar, live with Dr. McDougall. I am Gustavo Tolosa, uh, the webinar coordinator and moderator for Dr. McDougall. But today, we have a very uh, wonderful, uh, even I would say distinguished guest, and it is uh, Dr. Uh, Doug Lyle. Many of you <clears throat> uh, probably know him because you have attended uh, the 10-day uh, living clinic at Santa Rosa where Dr. McDougall uh, does the clinic. And uh, I just want to say a few words about Dr. Uh, Lyle. is the psychologist for the McDougall Wellness Program and the director of research for True North Health Center, and he has lectured extensively uh, many places, including Stanford, Cornell, and other universities. And he's also the co-author of The Pleasure Trap, Mastering the Hidden Force That Undermines Health and Happiness. And I would highly suggest that you uh, get that book. Later on, we will share I will share with all of you uh, his website and email address in case you would like to uh, get in touch with him. And now, without further ado, I will uh, introduce Dr. Doug Lyle. Thank you so much for being here today, and we are all looking forward to hearing you. Oh, it's a pleasure. A time for me to hit my little green box. It is, so that you can start sharing your PowerPoint presentation. And right. while you do that, I just want to <clears throat> tell um, uh, everybody that today we are, I am uh, disabling the chat so that you all can really concentrate on this uh, brilliant presentation. There is a lot of food for thought here. There's a lot for you to think about, and we don't want to have any distractions during the presentation. Like I said, later, later on, you can, uh, I will give you the address so that you can get in touch with Dr. Lyle and go ahead. We're ready to go. Thank you very much, Gustavo. Well, folks, uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Doug Lyle and I'm a psychologist and it actually wasn't my first choice to get stuck in psychology. I, I was planning to be an artist. As you can see from my first slide, I had incredible talent. But uh, I just didn't get the support from my parents, so I wound up doing this. Now, <laughs> I got I got even as as you'll see the great the great skill that I use here. The uh, this this lecture is going to be about uh, taking things one step at a time and taking them slowly and being methodical. And it's really the old story of the tortoise and the hare. And we're going to find out um, some reasons why it's hard to do this, but also why it is the best way to do it. So we're going to begin now uh, with the first slide. Here is uh, a classic uh, in, in the hair strategy of diet. Everybody knows who this is, of course. And well, maybe you don't. But actually, this is Dr. Atkins. Says so right on his shirt. And he's wearing the rabbit ears. And here we are around 1990, where this became extremely popular. And it still reverberates today as they're passing out little hair costumes to everybody, essentially promising them that they can lose a great deal of weight very fast. This uh, would be very big business, particularly in January, where people have New Year's resolutions and really want to take off quickly and get to their goals. So this is, uh, well, everybody knows what this is, of course, in case you can't figure this out. This is a, this is a tortoise shell. And this is actually what it is that we want to be wearing instead of a pair of rabbit ears. And we're going to move through this with the concept of the tortoise in mind. So this is the old story of the tortoise and the hare. And then in the middle, there's a fancy little thing with an M in it. And we're going to see what that is in a minute, a few minutes later. Now, it's going to turn out that procrastination winds up being a key issue when it turns out uh, it, it stands in the people's way of trying to get where they want to go. And people will feel this. They will feel like they're fiddling around, procrastinating, avoiding, putting things off, etc. And what we want to do is we want to try to figure out why there is procrastination with respect to goals. And it turns out there's actually two reasons, which is what makes the analysis of procrastination a little bit tricky to understand. So first we're going to look at um, 
the clever, there's a good reason, there's a bad reason to procrastinate. Here's the good reason. Now suppose that you're living in an ancient environment and there's some gal that, that makes jewelry and uh, I'm gonna go uh, promise her 20 coconuts by the next full moon if she'll go ahead and give me that jewelry now. Well, the good news is, is that I'm gonna get the jewelry now when I need it and I may never have to pay back those 20 coconuts because there's no telling what might happen to that woman between now and the next full moon. And so it's going to turn out there's actually very intelligent reasons to procrastinate and uh, because very often the, the debt or obligation or expectation that somebody may have for us may be something that if we can fiddle around long enough, we might not have to do it. So that actually makes the cost benefit of procrastination uh, weigh heavily towards the benefit side uh, the more we fiddle. So, for example, uh, for 10 years I worked in the prison system in California and the, uh, there was constant directives coming down from the big shots in Sacramento that would then pass them on to the big shot, my supervisor, and then there's all of us psychologists and we would look at these things and just roll our eyes and laugh, quite frankly, <laughs> because we could imagine this happening throughout the state to our fellow psychologists, and we knew how uh, avoidant our fellow psychologists were at actually taking on any new directive, particularly if it looked ridiculous. So some of, some of my colleagues would argue and make a big fuss about it, but my friends and I never did. We would just tell the supervisor, sure, sure, we'll get to that. And then almost inevitably, we never had to do it. So this is where procrastination actually pays. And that's a reason why it's a characteristic of human psychology is because very often the benefit is greater for procrastinating than the cost is. And so that's why it's inside of human nature. The fiddling around is actually profitable. Now, however, we all know that when it comes to some important personal goals, there's another procrastination process that's actually mysteriously destructive. This is, for example, the classic in, in for alcoholics is, I'll start tomorrow, um, next week, or right after this or that takes place, right after, after my daughter's wedding, then I'll get to it. After I get done with this big thing at work, then I'll get to it. There's a, there's a very tenacious procrastination dynamic, and we're gonna need to understand a little bit more about human nature to find out why there would be a self-destructive process that procrastination sits in the middle of. And in order to do that, we're gonna to need to understand what we're gonna call esteem processes. So this is how esteem works. Inside your head, you actually have, well, I'm gonna call two parts of you. One of them is gonna be what I call you, and the other part is going to be what I'm gonna call an esteem meter. And it's going to turn out that human beings are designed by nature largely, not exclusively, but largely, they're designed to seek esteem. That is a feeling of being valued by other people. And so in order to do that well, in order to be valued by other people, um, we need to be aware that of how it is that they're feeling about our performances. So that's why you like to, if you cook, for example, for friends, you like to watch their reactions to see how happy they are with the food. And then you're watching them as they give you feedback about how it is that they value you. If you are a musical performer, you do the same thing. You're, you're not only do you perform, but then you watch and listen to the feedback that people give you uh, after your performance. So uh, if you put on a new suit or a new dress, you are watching for people's reactions to how it is that they feel, uh, that they signal that they feel about your appearance. So you're actually designed to be sensitive to how, how uh, valuable other people seem to find you, and that's why you have an esteem meter inside your head that is actually a very large amount of what the brain does. Now, this is... Uh, in case you didn't know what bird this was, I mean, some of you that are have, have more artistic sort of savvy would know, but some of you might not know. So it's going to turn out that this is a blue-footed booby bird, and what this bird does is it squirts a ring of bird manure in a circle. It's called the guano ring, and guano is bird poop. And what this is is it's a little signaling device 
that uh, mama does and she puts a circle around her little chicks and anything that's outside the guano ring uh, she will she will attack aggressively if it tries to come in so there's essentially a boundary line between us and them and that this winds up being a critical issue in the the behavior of the blue-footed booby bird now it's also true that human beings do the same thing but they just don't use a guano ring they have a psychological guano ring where they have an in-group or an inclusion group and then where they like each other and they're all sort of part of a team. And then people on the outside of the guano ring we're more suspicious of and we're not as friendly to, et cetera. Now, human beings are pretty friendly, but they're still aware of a little concept of the guano ring that sort of encircles their lives. And so that esteem meter is designed by nature to check the feedback to make sure to help you stay inside the guano ring make sure that other people are feeling good about you. Now, the, um, so here, here's our gal inside the guano ring with her friends. And so it turns out that when she gets positive big signals, esteem signals from them, it causes us to feel happy and confident and, and even feel proud, like people like us and we like that. If we get negative feedback, like they're thinking about kicking us out of the guano ring, then it will cause us to feel depressed, to feel rejected or to feel anxiety. So essentially, happiness is, is largely being guided uh, by our esteem meter and its sensitivity to the feedback from other people. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to use these ideas to try to understand the process of procrastination, uh, self-destructive procrastination. And the, uh, I'm gonna tell the story of a little kid named Harry Steinway. This isn't a real kid, I just made him up. So. He lives in Pittsburgh, and he's got a little sister, Elsa, and then Mrs. Steinway. You can see that she's a piece of work. Mr. Steinway just keeps his mouth shut and doesn't really, isn't involved in this drama. Now, Harry, from the time he was six, got encouraged to play the piano by Mrs. Steinway, and she intends for him to be a great pianist one day, and he likes this. And so by the time he's eight years old, he's sort of a 60th percentile player there in the middle of the graph. Uh, relative to other kids, and by the time he's nine, he might be a 70th percentile pianist, and he keeps working, and as he gets better and moves up higher in the food chain, it feels good. He gets good feedback. Mom tells him he's going to be great, and uh, he can say, see that he's improving, and his esteem mechanisms <clears throat> are giving him nothing but good feedback. Now, he gets to the 80th percentile, and all is well, and his mom is telling him now that he's 10 years old, but soon he's going to be headed to Carnegie Hall and he's going to be this fantastic pianist. And that, that's fine as far as Harry's concerned. However, on this path one day, he winds up at a recital uh, and there's a girl named June there. And June has only been playing for a year and Harry's been playing for four years now. And June is quite a bit better. So Harry suddenly finds out that even though he's getting better and that feels good, it doesn't look like he's probably headed to Carnegie Hall. And so his mom uh, believes and keeps telling him that he's going to get over there, there to where the red star is, right up at the top. <clears throat> Harry, though, knows that if he continues to do as well as he can, he might only get to the 90th percentile, which means that there's going to be an esteem loss somewhere down the road as uh, his mother is going to have to figure out and confront the fact that Harry is not going to be at the 99.99th percentile he may only be at the 90th percentile, and therefore he has fallen short of her expectations, which means he's going to lose esteem. And we know what happens when we lose esteem. We wind up depressed, anxious, and we want to avoid these things uh, because it's not a good feeling, and we're embarrassed. So in order to avoid this, uh, he wants to actually hold on to the esteem as long as he can. Uh, that esteem is valuable currency. It's essentially the currency of the Stone Age environment. So before there was money, what there was was esteem. And so that's why uh, we work so hard to get it. We try to do things in the village to be valued, to show our value to other people. And that's why the esteem meter is this critical feature and lever over human psychology. So what Harry's going to do is going to be something quite dramatic. And that is that he's going to stop trying. He will quit putting in much effort on the piano. And the reason why he's going to do that is that as he continues to have his skills slide by not playing, 
And his mother keeps saying, oh, but Harry, you could be fantastic. Oh, Harry, you could go to Carnegie Hall. What is the matter with you? As long as she keeps saying that, then he knows he still has this esteem or he still has the status. The, uh, if he tries, what's going to happen is he will absolutely lose the status because he will not be living up to expectation. So therefore, it winds up being an extraordinarily clever trick to stop trying, and this is the root of procrastination. Now, it turns out it does not feel good to do this. It feels bad to do this. It's, in fact, uh, very disturbing. Harry is angry. He's upset. He's depressed. He's embarrassed. He may even, believe it or not, feel suicidal impulses. He feels self-destructive. He actually doesn't know what is causing this, but he does know he's in some kind of a great motivational trap. Uh, he just doesn't know how to work it out, and neither does his mother. As she continues to reassure him how great he is, he continues to dig his heels in and to not try. Now, this is the procrastination dynamic. And the esteem meter, if you think about it, this is uh, there's a word that we have in the language to describe the esteem meter that um, that I don't use right off the bat, but it makes complete sense. Let's suppose we do something and we get a lot of really good feedback from people. Then we would think, for example, wow, that was, quote, good for my ego. That's what that sounds like. If we got bad feedback, suppose we applied for three jobs and we expected to get, get offers from all of them and we didn't get offers from any, that would be, quote, tough on our ego. So ego is actually the word that we use to describe the esteem meter. Now, I try to not use that word because it brings in all kinds of other concepts from psychoanalysis that we don't want in the mess. But if we just think of the esteem meter as what you and I call ego, then this, then it all comes together in what I call the ego trap. So the ego, the desire to get esteem from other people by doing a good job, winds up put in a motivational dilemma, a procrastination dilemma, where people quit trying their best because if they do their best, it will fall short of the expectations of other people, and therefore they will actually lose esteem. This is what I call the ego trap. So there's normal ego motivation where we are making progress and it feels good, but that motivational mechanism can be trapped by expectations that get too high. Let me give you examples. So there are, quote, brilliant students that everybody expects to do fantastic and get into Harvard, and et cetera. And you will very often find these people go the other direction as the parents keep reassuring that the kids that if they keep trying harder, they will do great things and the kids will dig in and absolutely fail or they will fail selectively. They'll make sure that, that they, it is clear that they are not trying, and therefore the failures that are being observed are not evidence that the kid is not competent. So uh, black belts, very often in the martial arts, as soon as uh, someone gets a black belt, this means in theory uh, in the culture that they're, they should be a world champion and should be impossible for them to be defeated by someone who is not a black belt. And of course, this is ridiculous. It's not true at all. Uh, very often, a, 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 in, any given, in any given encounter, a person of a lower grade can beat a person of a higher grade. And so black belts, very often, uh, when people achieve that level, they quit. Uh, they, or they stand around on the mat and don't compete. They don't want to do that because they do not want to lose, because they would lose status. Also, a lot of times, uh, young men especially, or old men too, but trying to date, they will be very squirrely with women about asking them out or asking for, uh, for their time. They will, they will nose around the issue because they don't actually want to ask and then get rejected. So, uh, so if they've never really asked, they've never really been rejected. And so they hint around and hint around looking for positive feedback and cues that if they did ask, they would be successful. And a lot of times they never ask. So, this is, uh, these are examples of a procrastination dynamic. Now, don't be afraid of this chart. This is, we're going to now put a lot of things together here. It's not that complicated. Look at our girl, and she's got those two parts of her mind. One part of it is her, and the other part is her esteem meter. It's going to turn out there are three main classes of relationships that people have to compete for. Um, I don't put family in there because generally you don't have to compete to be somebody's mother. So even though that's an important set of relationships within family, 
But these other three uh, types of relationships are all necessarily competitive. You have to compete in the mating arena, you have to compete for friends, and you have to compete for jobs and customers. So it's going to turn out that these are all competitive processes and the feedback that happens impacts the esteem meter. Now, uh, what's going to happen is all of those processes, the competitive processes are cost-benefit analyses, in which the people in the marketplace are actually running cost-benefit on, on our individual and what it, what it is that they have to offer. So in the trade department, the guy with the square head there is deciding whether or not he wants to hire our girl, and he thinks about her and her abilities relative to all of his other options, and he runs a cost-benefit analysis. So all this competitive process is all cost-benefit uh, feedback, essentially, and so what people are going to do in order to do better is they're going to rehearse. So we don't just try to get mates, we also go to the store, get clothes, shine up our car, get our hair cut. We do a lot of things in order to rehearse, in order to get better at the competitive process. That's what a resume is, that's what going to school and getting good grades are. You are rehearsing for the trade arena. Now, it's going to turn out that it doesn't do any good to rehearse unless you have a feedback system that tells you that your rehearsals are, are effective. So it's going to turn out that human beings have created inside of their natural history an internal audience. And that internal audience watches your rehearsals and it gives feedback to the esteem meter. So for example, if you move furniture around in your house to try to make it look more elegant, you, uh, as you are pleased with an arrangement, you look at it and you are looking at the new arrangement through the eyes of theoretical other people for example, friends, that would look at your arrangement and say, ah, that looks really nice. But it, there are no people in the room, and they are not giving you feedback to your esteem meter. In fact, it's your internal audience that is serving as a proxy for those people. If you go shopping for a new dress, uh, in order to be more attractive to mates, for example, you, you put on a dress and you look in the mirror at Macy's, and the internal audience then says either thumbs up or thumbs down. And so it is in this way that the internal audience, uh, this is what philosophers call consciousness or self-consciousness. Uh, they haven't known why it is that people have such a thing. But human beings live with these little people that essentially live inside our heads. And they're constantly giving us little feedback on our performances uh, when nobody's watching. They're giving us performances on rehearsals. Think of a young guy in his driveway, a young kid shooting baskets and he will be thinking about a last second shot in the big championship game that he's going to take one day, and he'll even count it down out loud as if a bunch of people are watching. And if he makes the shot, his internal audience says, wow, he did great, and he can actually feel pride and happiness, even though nobody's watching and nobody cares. It's a rehearsal mechanism for the future. So this is actually two different processes that I call esteem, which is the actual feedback from real live people, that really hits our esteem meter. But also we have a self-esteem mechanism from the internal audience that will do the same thing as it watches our behavior from inside. Okay, now, so here's what can happen. Is that, remember, remember Harry Steinway's mother, that she set expectations too high and therefore he had to defend his esteem from her by not trying. But the same thing can happen from the inside, from our internal audience. That we can pick up cues that we believe that people out in the world have high expectations for us. We might not even know who they are, or we can't even put a name to a face. But we have absorbed it and it has become part of our internal expectations. And so if the internal audience has set the bar too high, then the self freezes under these internal high expectations and procrastinates its way through the ego trap. So in other words, you don't want to, quote, lose status with yourself by falling short of your own expectations. This winds up being a major uh, pro procrastination self-destruction dynamic in human beings. It's an extraordinary one. Mark Leary at Duke uh, calls this, you know, essentially the curse of the self that human beings can do things to themselves and stop their own, their own uh, advances in a way that no other creature can do 
because they don't have an internal audience because they don't have such a fancy mind. Now, however, I don't look at it as a curse. I just look at it as another adaptive instinct that can run into trouble. So you have many adaptive instincts in your mind. You've got a hunger drive. You've got a thirst mechanism. You've got the ability to use language. That's an instinct. You also have the ability to imagine the worst case scenario. Uh, that's an instinct in people. So if your kid doesn't call you uh, when they were supposed to get down from the airplane a half an hour ago, then you start thinking about the worst case scenario. So that's a natural component of human beings that help them avoid trouble. But you also have a procrastination instinct. That instinct has two basic features. Number one, it's me being a flake with my supervisor at the prison. That's a savvy energy conserving instinct that basically runs the cost benefit and says, you know what, I don't think I'm going to get into much trouble if I don't do this. And if I don't do it, I might not ever have to do it. But the other procrastination instinct is self-destruction by way of esteem defense. And that esteem defense can be uh, the, the Steinway defense. It can be, in other words, defending our esteem loss from a specific individual like our mother. Or it could be an internal expectation, the internal version of the ego trap. Either way, it's a really bad destructive process, but it's, it's built in there because it can be of net benefit. Now, sources of crushing expectations, where do they happen? Well, we pick them up from all over the place. The, the culture, for example, sort of expects, if you're an alcoholic, they expect you that you ought to be able to just put down the bottle. That they actually, people that don't have that problem, do not actually understand how difficult that problem is. And as a result, they can put alcoholics into the ego trap, and the alcoholics can absorb those expectations into their internal audience. And therefore, they can actually hide from themselves, from their own internal audience, and continually procrastinate and say, you know what, I'll start tomorrow. And that winds up being a very crushing dynamic. It's the, sometimes the source is uh, easy to see how this could happen. So for example, we go back to our Atkins thing. So there are, uh, one of the famous ads that was responsible for a billion dollar fortune was a thing called SlimFast. And SlimFast, uh, was a bunch of chocolate shakes that they said, give us a week and we'll take off the weight. And people would, would t uh, drink slim fast shakes for a week and they'd lose 10 pounds. They didn't lose any fat. Uh, slim fast was very, very low in sodium. And if all the people did was to, to just drink chocolate shakes for a week, it turns out that big people, overweight people are very often uh, retaining a lot of water because they have a high sodium diet. And as a result, they would diurese or they would lose the water behind the low sodium diet for a week and they'd lose 10 or 15 pounds and they're all excited. However, they haven't lost a single bit of fat. They just ate a high fat chocolate diet for a week, but they have no idea uh, uh, that this is actually going on. And all they need to do is eat one tiny little bag of potato chips and within the next three days, they're going to gain all that 10 pounds back because they're going to absorb the water. This led to, you know, untold turbulence in people's self-esteems as they would lose the weight and gain the weight, lose the weight and gain the weight, and uh, slim fast uh, laughed their way all the way to a billion dollar fortune behind this sort of ridiculous thing. This is a horrendous example of the hair putting on, putting on the wrong costume and winding up in a mess. Here's the right costume. Right costume is a tortoise shell, and the tortoise shell is hardened against the criticism that you're going to get if you do this the right way. Um, if you don't know my uh, lecture uh, uh, called the Getting Along Without Going Along, there's certain things I say to people when people cross-examine me about my diet, and I encourage you to use similar things. So if people say, well, where would you get your protein from? Just tell them you don't know. Okay, I don't know. Seems like it's okay. And they say it won't work, and you tell them, no, you're probably right. It's just an experiment. And what, you're not going to eat any pickled pig's feet? You say, no, oh, I'm just going to do this. It seems to be working for me right now, but we'll see what happens. And as they predict gloom and doom because you are an idiot who's not eating chicken uh, and doing paleo or Atkins or whatever else, that you're eating carbohydrates, for goodness sakes, what you do is you just keep your mouth shut. Okay, you just let, you know, just say, look, who knows? You're probably right and you just get out of there. 
We have no interest in defending a theory here. We just want you to get on the tortoise trail. Now, this is the tortoise trail. Let everybody else go on the hare highway and just hop right to the mess that they're headed for. It's not their fault. They've been sold a bill of goods. They're not as educated as we are, and that's okay. Like, it's not your job to educate the world. Your job is to get on the tortoise trail, get your tortoise shell on, and start moving in the right direction, which means you have to be very myopic. Tortoises only look at the, the little bit of grass that's right in front of them. We do not try to look out at the 40 pounds we want to lose, the 28 pounds we want to lose by summer. Don't get lost in that. Of course, your mind is going to drift to that, but your job is to get myopic. You got to be very short. Uh, thinking here. And in order to do that, you're going to need the McDougal medallion. So now we know what this is. We've got a tortoise that can barely see, can only see about an inch in front of its face. It's got a nice hardened tortoise shell against all the critiques, and it's got a medallion around its neck telling it which direction it needs to be very slowly moving towards. And on that McDougal medallion, it says it's the food, which is what John McDougal always says. <laughs> <laughs> this is it, all right? And on that, on the other side of the McDougal medallion, there's the instructions about where to go. So let me tell you what this actually looks like. There it is. It says starch targets. And the starch targets are that you want to eat every day starch-based meals, some fruit, some salad maybe, and some exercise. Don't make a big deal out of the exercise. It doesn't have to be a big deal. Uh, if you're a big exerciser, great. If you're not, just get up and move, put some dance tunes on and wiggle around in your living room uh, where nobody has to see you. Just enjoy yourself. But we want to do a little bit of exercise if we can every day. But we're not going to look to be perfect here because none of us is a saint and things come up in life. So actually our job, the goal, is every week we're going to try to aim for these six targets every day. But the goal is to only hit 80% of them. And that's about 34 out of those 42 targets. So if we do this, and so certain days, so you see the first day there, I didn't get three starches in and I didn't get any exercise in. That's okay. I got four out of the six. The next day I got five out of the six and the next day I got a different five out of the six. And At the end of the week, you kind of add them up. Score, and then we go on to the next week. Uh, now, uh, Dr. Lyle, we lost your uh, your PowerPoint presentation. Okay. If you don't mind, we. Um, How do I? Uh, you're gonna. It stopped uh, sharing, so I think you're gonna have to click on this uh, share again. Yeah, I think I'm having a hard time getting to it. I, I might have to hit a cancel button down at the bottom. I don't know. Okay, try that. <laughs> okay, we'll try that. And see what happens. Okay, it says once they want to continue to need to think to start. Hold on a second. Let's see if you can find. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Here okay. we go, and we are back live. Is that good? Perfect. Great. Beautiful. Okay, so here we are again. And uh, we're just trying to every week try to hit about 34. And what we would like in our minds is this notion that, hey, you can do this. This is very doable. We're not trying to have in our mind that we're going to lose 38 pounds by September. We're going to just hit these little check boxes today. And then we're going to hit them tomorrow. And that's how we're going to do it. We're just going to do one little check box at a time. It's not that complicated. Now, so what we're going to try to do is get outside of these motivational traps. That we're not going to be chasing the self-esteem uh, and just trying to quickly get to this goal so that we can look great. We know that that's where we're, we're trying to head for that esteem, but instead we want to focus on the self-esteem process of just checking the box because your internal audience will be watching you, and if you check those boxes, it will know that you're checking them. The... Um, and we are not going to be focused so much on this scale because the scale lies. It fluctuates all the time and is very disruptive for people's uh, confidence. Instead, I want you to focus on the check boxes. And over time, if we are doing this right, we're going to see some weight loss. We need to be myopic and just get ourselves lost in the process as we continue to check these boxes. 
We have to have a spirit that we're going to learn as we go. Remember from the old movie, um, The Karate Kid, where Mr. Miyagi has Daniel out there putting wax on his car and taking it off. And getting him lost in the process of putting wax on and wax off is how he learned. My dad did the same thing with me with a pulse hole digger, and I wasn't too excited about it, but that such is life for me. <laughs> now, here's the real math that takes place with respect to weight loss. The average woman at 36 years old in the United States is about 166 pounds, and she's gained about uh, two pounds a year uh, for 20 years since she was 16. So it's been a very subtle, uh, slow process of her digging this hole for herself. We want to dig out of that hole pretty quickly, but we're not going to get out of there instantaneously. If we put the tortoise shell on and check these boxes, we're very likely to lose maybe a pound a week, which means that in six weeks, you will have re rewound the tape by three years. And as we continue on another six weeks, we're going to get rid of another three years. In other words, as we chip away at this process, it's not an insurmountable goal at all. We just have to chip, chip, chip away and do the process correctly. Sometimes it's good to have little one uh, 16 ounce bottles around of water because that's how big a, a pound of fat is. So when you lose a pound of fat in a week, you look at a 16 ounce uh, bottle of water and you realize that's how much fat came off your body. You can't see it, but it can be seen. And by the time you've lost six pounds, you've lost a tremendous amount of fat and you need to just stay the course and keep chipping away. When Steven Spielberg made Raiders of the Lost Ark, he actually designed every little bit of that thing and put together, it was all ready to go. Uh, people were amazed at how detailed and organized he was. He knew the, the 2,000 little shots that he needed. And all he did was just go every little shot's about six seconds long. And so all it was was just do a six second shot and then do another six second shot and then do another six second shot. And you just put together that little piece, one piece at a time. And that's how you make a movie. When people want to know how it is that you take off 25 pounds, I could tell you how you do it. You take it off one starch meal at a time, one little exercise at a time, one little salad at a time. That's how it's done. Don't look at any big magic. Look at little small processes. You know, people would never get ed educations and graduate from college or high school if it were done all at once and you had one big exam. It turns out that people do it one little quiz, one little exam at a time, one little chapter at a time. And there's little feedback mechanisms to tell people on the way that that's how you do it. And that's the only way that something like that gets done. You don't buy a house all at once, not unless you get lucky and win the lottery. You just, you own your home one little bit at a time and you build relationships one little bit at a time. And you raise your children one little bit at a time. They don't go from being three years old to being 23 years old and college graduates in a leap. It's one little step, and that's how everything of any significance is actually accomplished. Nothing is accomplished through some dramatic, you know, instantaneous shortcut to great success. All successes and everything that means anything is one little good move at a time after the next. And this is the difference conceptually between the fork on the road that people face in January, whether they're going to get on the hair highway and try some trick that's going to get them to their swimming suit body in June, or they're going to go on the tortoise trail and actually earn it. The, uh, you know, a, a wise person once said, summer bodies are made in the winter. They are. They're made now, one step at a time, one good decision at a time. And as we do that, we do not have to be perfect. Hit 80% of your targets, and this is going to be how you get to the life you deserve. Thank you very much for listening, folks. Thank you, Gustavo, for your help. I could never have figured out the first thing about this without you. And, uh, and if you uh, if folks want to get a hold of me, Gustavo will show you how to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lyle. Um, and I just want to say something that really, uh, I don't know, I, I, I think is very important for everybody because when it's about, when it comes to, to weight and losing weight, people all of a sudden want to lose, you know, 10 pounds in a week. And, uh, what you were saying is so true how uh, it's one step at a time 
and you mentioned school and I remember going through my masters and my doctorate and, and, and I had to focus on what the next hour was because if I thought of even, even the next day, I would be so overwhelmed, I would want to quit. Um, so thank you for reminding us. That is, I think, a very important point. Very good. Thank you. My thank pleasure. You. So um, everybody, I have put a little sticky note and now another um, announcement so that you can actually visit Dr. Lyle's um, website and you can have his email, dr.lyle at yahoo.com. And um, uh, thank you again, uh, Dr. Lyle. And uh, we hope to have you as a guest in the near future. One more thank time. you. And everybody else, we will see you next Thursday at our usual time. Dr. McDougall is going to do something a little different. He will answer the uh, 20 most uh, frequently asked questions about the START solutions, uh, the START solution. And those questions are going to be compiled and um, we will go uh, through each one of them. And I think it's going to be a very, interesting, practical, useful webinar that you will be able to watch time after time again as you read his book, The Start Solution. So we will see you all next week and uh, have a great week. Bye-bye.